Hey guys, it's uh, James Davis today making a poker video. Um, I don't really have anything clever to say about it, <laughs> except that uh, you know I'll be playing two tables of um, I think five ten, maybe three six, depending on if something good pops up, and seeing how things go. I'm on two bad tables right now. I've been focusing more on game selection, but once again, it's always fun to make videos playing against regulars who play a little bit tougher and uh, who are going to possibly put us in some difficult spots for the sake of the video. An interesting pot right there. It looked like um, P.A. Dirk opened with the 4-3 suited in under the gun, which is not something I necessarily thought he was capable of. Um, folded around to the big blind, who's Moirims, and he decided to call with the two jacks. Now the flop came 4-3-2, and Moirums, I decided to just check call with the jacks. I thought that was sort of an interesting choice. Um, and I think maybe, I'm not sure what I would do, but I think I probably would have played it a little faster. Um, then the two comes on the river, and it's a standard check-check, but I think maybe Moirums left a little bit on the table. But then again, my read on P.A. Dirk was that he, he played pretty tightly under the gun, so <clears throat> it's possible that Moirums had the same read and uh, decided to go with it. I see next world champ doesn't raise the small blind all that often, only about 30%, so I'm happy to give him the pot there. On the other hand, um, insider raises the small blind a lot, uh, about 30%. So against a guy like that, I'm going to be I'm going to be playing back at him a lot more. And this table is just about broken up, so I'm going to get a new one. No reason to give away all my awesome strategies for busting up short stacks. And we have another bad game against more good opponents. <laughs> Lucky me. Alright, so let me shut this down and line this one up. You can hear my awesome dog barking in the background. He's a good dog, but boy, does he bark like a wild man. Okay, so as I was saying, Insider raises the button and small blind a lot. And so, versus him, I'm going to play a lot of hands uh, for three bets, uh, anticipating that he's going to be folding to a lot of my three bets. And I think this is just a nice way to build up my aggressive image in case I get hands against other players at the table whom I would be less likely to three bet. So... Um, for now against him. And you know, I'll, I'll change that up as things go along. Obviously I won't be able to get away with it all the time or forever, but um, for now, for now I'm going to take that line against him. So like Moirums, um folds to three bets only 44%, so that's not a guy who I'm necessarily going to be taking a lot of speculative hands with, um, or not going to take a lot of speculative hands against him, especially out of position. He plays a pretty unorthodox style, but it's one that must have been effective because he's been playing these games for a long time. And on the right hand table, I'm just going to post my blind. Not optimal to post your blind in a cutoff in a 6 max game, obviously, but I don't have time to be optimal when I'm making a video. Plus, now I have two fives, which is awesome because I can get away with some, some silliness. Uh, More rooms raises 21% under the gun. I'm just going to call with my pocket fives. Uh, my idea here. It's going to be if, like, Next World Champ or Pork, Pork Tom 3-bets, um, or Insider for that matter, and Moirums quits the pot, then I might just shove my pocket 5s, um, figuring that they're going to be 3-betting as a squeeze with a lot of more speculative hands and less with hands like pocket 10s, especially because Insider is so deep uh, with Moirums. So he just folds. Uh, I'm going to check Moirums' stats on this table real quick. I see that he... C bets just about 65% of the time. Um, and when he doesn't C bet a, a king 8 8 board, it's just a little fishy. Um, it makes me think he's taking a showdown line, so I'm just going to check it through and, you know, bang out a 5 on the turn. And now my line just looks really funny because I've uh, checked through the flop and I'm raising the turn, so my line is pretty strong now. 
but it's also a little fishy. You know, the five could have definitely given me new draws, like six, seven. Um, I could just, you know, he he could think that his actions have looked weak so far and wanting to play accordingly, or he could just have two kings, in which case he played great because he's going to stack me here. But he just folds, and I, but I still like the decision to play it quickly because um, I don't really think. I mean, if I call there. I'm, I'm representing strength anyway. I'm representing the fact that I'm probably going to go to showdown. It's tough for me to have um, a draw, given that I check back the flop and all of a sudden I'm racing the turn. That would be a pretty poor way to play a flush draw or something. So when I'm raising there, I'm hoping that he's putting me on a pure bluff. Apologize if you can still hear my dog barking. He's outside, but still carrying on. Uh, I wasn't going to take a nine-eight suited against him heads up. Um, he's been he's not yet raised a hand in early position, which is obviously a red flag. But given that, actually, I probably have odds to uh, to see a flop here. If he does decide to go ahead and bet this flop, I will be folding because I really don't have the odds to chase a five outer. And you know, if like a nine comes off, it's not clear that I'll get that I'll get any action from him anyway, so I think in that case um, I'm just going to have to f to fold it if he bets. Especially given the fact that he has two opponents in the pot on a flop that is very likely to have hit us. I really don't think that he's going to be going to be messing around too much. Got to get out of the habit of clicking auto check fold. Although with more rooms raises the button, I'm I'm going to be folding. Even though he he raises a lot of hands from the button, I really don't think I can get away from get away with it. Uh, it's interesting with PA Dirk because he raises in the past has raised a very tight range from the small blind. You see, well, you don't see it, but it's just 13 percent. So I'm going to fold the 9-6 off suit, but I'm sort of going to keep my eyes peeled on him, um, thinking, you know, because I have a huge sample on him, and that range is back from a really long time ago. So he might have very well just, like, changed his game, and if he has been changing his game up, I need to keep my eyes peeled for that. Uh, the 8-6 suited really, really can't be played when Moyrams is coming out of the cutoff there. Next world champ certainly is capable of squeezing so I can't call and I can't really 3-bet because he's going to come to a lot of flops against me so um, and that's not to say you can never 3-bet lightly against someone who calls a lot of 3-bets but um, you know you'd, you'd like to sort of pick and choose your spots for the most part um, now like for instance in a 3-bet pot you can't see the stats, but I'll read them to you. Now, he folds to 3-bet just 44% of the time. Now, against a C-bet on those flops, he folds only 35% of the time. So in those situations, he's actually making it really, really tough on his opponents in those 3-bet pots. Now, that's great if I have a big pair or, or you know, hand like ace-king or something that's going to stand to make a lot of flops that um, can stand a lot of action, but when I just have you know, a, a more marginal hand, it's a lot tougher for me to take down the pot unimproved. And unless I want to back it up with, you know, some sort of outrageous bet three, bet bluff all in, which I'm not quite ready to do w with just that much information, then, uh, then I sort of just need to slow down a little bit. So this this video should be good. It, it'll sort of give you an idea of how I play against tough opponents because there's really no fish on either of these two tables, and I would not play these tables. You know, I, I wouldn't wouldn't play these tables at all if it were just me. You know, sitting down uh, for my session right now. And I think it sort of speaks badly against these players uh, for playing in these games. You know, because I, I think it's pretty unlikely that any of them really has a big edge. So Moyrams raises such a wide range on the button. I know I wasn't gonna said I wasn't gonna take speculative hands against him, but I sort of would like to see where his head's at today. And you know maybe I can, since I, I do have the ace. You know I'm, I'm fairly 
I'm more likely to take it down right away. You know, as I'm thinking about it, maybe it's better to take a, a speculative hand like 6-8 suited, which will make a lot more, um, which will make a lot of disguised hands post-flop. But the ace-deuce, I, I don't think is too bad either. And so I just take down the pot on improves. And, and that's a nice result, obviously, if, you know, somewhat unexpected. I think I'm just going to go back to the well here with the ace-10, and, and I am actually going to re-raise P.A. Dirk now on the right-hand table. I don't know if he, uh, it seems like he's opening up his ranges a little bit, so I'm not just going to let him raise my small blind every time with impunity. Mm, Chicken on his 4-bet stuff, so he doesn't 4-bet that much. I, I am just going to 3-bet him again. And also against him, since he does call a wider range, you know, unlike a 10 high flop, I'm going to be happy to get it in against him. And it doesn't seem like he really bluffed four bets pre flop over that sample. I mean, I'm sure he's capable of it, but it doesn't seem like it's like one of his major moves or anything, so. Um, we get a, a similar flop to last time. This one's even drier. I think he's going to be less likely to fold this time, but I am gonna. I am probably going to bet the turn based on what comes off. See, I think it's fairly likely that he is just. Uh, is floating me on the flop, so I have to decide whether it's better to check or to bet. I think he'd also be capable of trapping me with the queen there. But if he checks through, because I, I think at this point he probably will call down if he has a pair below the queen. So I'm actually just going to check it. And if he checks, I'll sort of assume that he has a hand. Um, but if he bets, I might actually just call or even or even shove it. Because the four will actually improve a lot of his floats too. Um, when he checks now, I figured that he did have a pair and then he wasn't going to fold it, so... Now I'm pretty much just done with the hand. Now it sure seems that he's value betting. Uh, I don't think I can really call anymore. I, I think he would have bet his floats on the turn, which is why I was thinking about just calling, you know, if he bet the turn. But given that he checked it back, I feel like it's more likely that he actually had a hand. Because he's definitely the type of guy who will call with nothing on a queen 5 5 flop if he thinks I'm a weak player. I'm going to re-raise the ace-10 off. Once again, I don't, I can't call it because of the, the blinds. You know, they, it just gives them too much incentive to four bet me or three bet me pre-flop. I think P.A. Dirk is wait, raising somewhat of a wide range from the cutoff, and he's not too out of the line in general. So, I think I'll stand and take it down a decent amount of time right away. I like to check people's three bet spy position. Um, it looks like Leaky Fawcett doesn't really. Th well, hasn't in the past really three bet much off the button, so I'm going to be raising a fair bit of hands from the cutoff with him and them with him on the button. I don't plan on playing this king six off suit under basically any circumstances with the next world champ in the big blind because he, I think, is pretty likely to to play back at me or, or even just call and um, you know my hand just really doesn't make that many favorable situations. So let's see here. Hmm, I seem to have lost my recording box. Hope this is still going. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so you could see, I mean, 
games like this will tend to break up a decent amount when good players leave. We actually got lucky here a fish, not a fish, but uh, a nonconformist player, <laughs> J.K. Hasse, decided to sit with us on the left-hand table, um, you know, politely sitting directly next to me and giving me a really good position, so I'm obviously very happy about that development. And whenever a fish sits, you know, even in a limited sample, I like to just check in. Um, looks like he doesn't three bet much. Otherwise, he's just a pretty. He seems to just be a fairly standard player. Check in with Pork Tom stats here. He he doesn't really fold to many three bets either. So when he raises the cutoff, I'm not assuming that he's doing so with the intention of probably coming along if I decide to get fancy with my queen 10 off. And so now it's basically going to be trying to take down small pots against the decent players while, um, you know, hopefully getting in situations where I can play against J.K. Hasse and, you know, play for value against him. Poor Tom three bets me out of the big blind. <clears throat> I have a couple options here. I can actually just call. Let me just check it and see if I have any good notes against him. See, I think he's raising a, a pretty wide range out of the big blind here. Uh, I'd like to check in, just see what his his c bet stats are. It looks like he actually doesn't c bet the flop every single time when he three bets out of the uh, out of the big blind. So. I'm going to call thinking that I can get to showdown unimproved a fair bit. I assume he's going to three bet this ace high flop. I'm um, going to actually think I'm going to going to try a raise on it. Cuz I think he'd basically have to bet this with with most of his range and uh just checking to see how that table is. Um and I think that it's likely enough that I have a hand I'm willing to go with on this board that he won't just like shove it as a bluff. Obviously, I, if he has an ace, I assume him, that he'll get it in, and he does here, so now I'm done with the hand. Possible that that bluff was poor, uh, he <laughs> and he's saying, ah, because I guess that means he just had a real hand. But um, um, now I'm, I'll make a note that he's seen me bluff raise three bet pot, a high board, um, and, and that's mostly just because Well, okay, so the reason I raised it, even though he doesn't see that much uh, in re-raised pots, is because, basically, if he's an aggressive player, he's going to be betting ace-high boards um, with all of his misses, you know? Like, he's going to always be betting, you know, just a random eight-jack or something on a board like that. Whereas, if he had, like, two queens, it's not totally clear that he would bet that flop, uh, given that he doesn't always see bet. So given that he bet it, I get put him on a polarized range of something like a monster, like ace-king, ace-queen, or just a total air ball. Uh, he's certainly capable of having air, there's no question about that. And so it becomes sort of a numbers game. Uh, when I race to 300 and there's about 300 in the pot, I only need to work half the time. And I really think that given that his range for betting that flop is big hands and, and misses and a lot of his marginal hands he'll check, I think that that raising looks pretty good given those assumptions. So I get a great situation against JK Hasse on the left hand table and now I'm just hoping to bet and bet and bet and get paid off. I'm not going anywhere on this board when he raises to 310. He's not super aggressive on the flop but the fact is is that I have top pair, top kicker. I think he would raise nines and sixes, so it's really just like jack nine I'm concerned about, and the rest of the stuff is like draws that I'm ahead of, um, even if marginally, or like king jack and stuff like that. Okay, so six nine. Very similar idea, and I just go ahead and make a jack and make him draw dead. <laughs> but really, like I said, uh, so many more of his hands. He, he's fairly aggressive even though he's a poor player, and when he check raises that flop, I guess I had discounted 6-9 suited, but, you know, stuff like jack-9, um, 
and given that I had a jack, that is obviously discounted. I don't think he can have jack sixes or nines, and a lot more of his range becomes hands, like just a top pair of jacks or or a draw. So even though I was slightly behind there, I'm happy to get it in and stack him off. And I will apologize to him. I didn't mean to get it in bad and get there. Sorry if that was tough for you guys to watch. But occasionally, even the greatest player in the world gets it in bad. I saw it happen on TV once where Phil Ivey got it in with a small set versus a big set. Okay, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Back to the reality. I'm going to actually 3-bet my ace-jack suited. I don't want to just call and invite the blinds in, really, because these guys, if they're going to come in, are often going to come in for 3-bet themselves. And then I sort of feel lost, or, I, or, I, or I'm in a situation where I might have to, like, shove um, with my ace-jack. Uh, and I just get in a situation where I can't really play the size of pot that I want in the situation that I want. So that's why I 3-bet it right away. Against a guy who bought in half-stack, I'm not going to just assume he's, like, a you know, expert right away, so I think that three betting there is perfectly reasonable. Even though you'll probably notice against a lot of good players, I won't I won't always three bet ace jack suited because a lot of the hands that they'll come to the flop with um will be dominating me or, you know, it'll be obvious when I may have when I've made a hand. Uh King Jack offsuit, PA Dirk doesn't get too aggressive pre flop. And I, I expect to just take the the pot down a lot of times against him here. I'm playing a pretty aggressive pre-flop style compared to what I normally play. Um, but I promise I've got good reason. I normally don't play on tables with so many good players. So uh, The aces, hopefully now I've three-bet P.A. Dirk a bunch of times. Hopefully he's going to get feisty someday, and he doesn't. But, you know, it can't have hurt my chances to get action from him by three betting him a lot of other times in more marginal situations. I got nothing to do with this three seven off suit. Um actually this Nambla Gambla seems to be pretty tight. And he folds to steals a lot in the blind. So actually I am gonna keep an eye on him. And I'm just checking in on another table. Mmm short stacks. Yeah it doesn't seem to be any better so I'll just get up from it. 4 6 suited, somewhat of an unorthodox raise, but Flower Powers isn't even sitting. Nambla Gambla doesn't seem to get too crazy out of the button if I just remember from my click. Yeah, and he has never threw bet out of the button, so he's taking a lot of his three bets out of the blinds and allows me to get heads up with the uh, with the big blind a lot of times in a situation where I'll be able to take down the pot if he misses or, you know, make a disguised hand. And 4 6 suited is definitely enough hand to take against a player of his caliber, so. Uh, with a hand like 2-9 suited, I'll just check in with my opponent's tendencies in the blinds. Um, when I raise that, this is actually something interesting to think about. So, next world champ is re-raises re 6% out of the small blind. Pork Tom re-raises 13%. That's still only 20%. And if I raise, um, and neither of them calls very much, so if I raise out of the... Uh, so if I raise out of the button um, to 30 and there's 15 already in the pot, that only needs to work two-thirds of the time, and I think that I definitely have a price to raise most hands. And especially, you know, I get an added overlay considering that occasionally they'll call, and 9-2 suited does make a couple, you know, it makes flushes, which are which are good, obviously. It's interesting versus Nambla Gamma because he really is so much more aggressive out of the big blind than anywhere else. Um, I'm just going to check if he's seen me do anything. Uh, I'm going to put in a small bluff 4-bet here. We're pretty deep, so he might actually call this, but I don't think he's too out of hand post-flop. So, And I don't expect him to bluff 5-bet me. I think if he's 5-betting me, he's got it. And he does. Uh, I'm finding, just to to be honest with you, that my bluff four bets have worked a lot less recently. I don't know if that's because people are bluff three betting less or because people are bluff five betting more. I tend to think that people are just lightly three betting less because I don't, I mean, unless people are just like so ballsy and I'm unaware of it and they're just like jamming it in there with their 10-9 suited and stuff more than I 
seem to realize. Uh, but either way, I've really tapered down my bluff for betting a lot. And I'm going to make a note that he saw me bluff for a bet. So it's definitely a case that my sample size in him was just small. And that, you know, he's just three betting with his mate hands. The thing is, 6% is a low range, but it's not absurdly low by any stretch. So. I figure occasionally he'll be capable of be having a bluff there. And this is a case on the right hand table. Well, I'll probably call my king queen off suit if Pork Tom uh, re raises. And I'll be willing to go with it if a king or a queen comes off. Let's see. Well, we're up a few bucks com from our suck out city on JK Hasse. I wonder if it means just kidding Hasse or if those are his first two initials, like James Carl Hasse. Or maybe it means, like, just kidding, Haas, but, like, trying to give the person an infeminate moniker, like, Hossy, Like, hey, Hossy. Um, but either way, I'd like to know. I I'd like to check in with him, because I'm a fan of Pork Tom. I think that's a really nice name. Um, Moy Rooms don't get it. I think he's foreign. Yeah, from France. So. Ooh. <laughs> wow. So on that left-hand table, we had two kings going up against king queen suited and the king queen suited managed to get ahead even though it's like one of the worst situations possible for it uh, but then truth and justice prevailed and the uh, kings won so um, I just check in on this guy's stats you know he just saw me fold to my three bet so I don't think he'll be quite as likely to to bluff me um, if he thinks I might be a little tilted. So that's why I just fire in a C bet on a 9 7 king uh, suited board. King Jack off suit. My plan is probably not to play it. But we'll see how things develop. Uh, well, now I'll play it with JK Hossie in the pot. It's not like the greatest multi way hand that ever lived, but um, it's not awful either considering it can easily have J.K. Hossie, or P.A. Dirk for that matter, in a dominated situation. I thought about betting that flop, to be honest with you, but uh, now that J.K. Hossie is full potting out on the turn, I'm I'm done with the hand. I'm actually going to make a note on J.K. Hossie too, that he raised me really quickly with a made hand. Um, I, I think that poor players especially, especially players who don't play multiple tables, are very likely to um, have timing tells, and so he seems like the type of guy sees those two pair, gets pumped up, fist pump, instant raise, like isn't gonna bother with any uh, melodramatics, um, you know. Whereas a lot of people will do that fake tank stuff or or whatever. Um, he doesn't seem to be one of those guys. So with him, I'm gonna I'm gonna be wary if he. if he acts quickly against me. He might do that with his big draws too, but poor players generally at least consider um, at least consider just calling with their draws. Okay, so 810 suited, Flower Powers raises me out of the small blind. Uh, he seems to do that a lot. My hand will make some decent stuff on the flop, so I will call. I've got position too. Um, when I make the Jack-9 deuce flop, it's sort of interesting. Um, I'm noting here, you can't see it, but in three bet pots, he see bets every single time. Um, I have to think that he'll do that in in situations where he's missed as well. But when he doesn't bet the jack nine two flop, well, it's a little interesting. Um, see, if I bet, I pretty much have to go with the hand. He might have something like ace queen. Really, I think I'm going to check, and I'm going to win this pot anyway if he does have a hand like ace-king and no overcard comes off, so that's why I check. I was, For what it's worth, if he bet, I was planning on raising. Um, when the king comes off, worst card in the deck, pretty much. Uh, I, I don't think I can really represent that king too well. Although, now when he checks, I 
think I will bat it. About note that I've also lost a little bit of juice um, with my queen because now that would make me a one card straight. And if he raises me here, not the end of the world. But I think now he can have something like ace queen or um, you know a pair below the board that's going to be tougher for him to call with. Obviously tens and eights are discounted, and he shoves on me, and I just look like a fool. But um, I, I mean I can't call now. <clears throat> Possibly I should have just been been looking at the fact that he checked that flop for the first time in a, in the history of hands I've seen with him. And that might have alerted me to the fact that he might be more likely to do that with a monster than a miss, but um, I don't know. It's possible that I played that hand completely backwards and it was just terrible. So <laughs> I'm interested to hear to hear you guys' impressions. Uh, Moyram's instantly three bets me from the big blind. Oh, let's see, let's see. Uh, even though we're a little deeper, Ace Four suited is just not not much of a hand. I've sort of got a bad image on this table. I'm just gonna to give it up. But back to the A10 suited hand. I mean, like I said, it's just possible that maybe I should have. Um, that maybe I should have bet the flop right away and went with it. I had such a good plan if <laughs> if no king or ace came on the turn. Maybe I should have really just stuck with my guns and realized that the king was the worst card in the deck to come off when he checks the flop. And I just checked it back and tried to make my straight. Because the other thing is is that if I make a seven, um, I'm just going to get paid off. So I think maybe I just didn't play it too well. And for what it's worth, I, I three bet my seven eight suited um, because I do want to play this hand against this opponent. But I don't want to play it for a call because I'm inviting um, these excellent players behind me to to just raise it and squeeze me out of the pot. See, this is sort of funny because I think he can definitely have just an ace here, so I'm going to bet one more time, and you know I can also make my ten or something um, when he calls. <laughs> it's like kind of sick. Um, it's kind of like a funny thing if I should value about this or not. Well, what I'm pondering right now is if he would always 4-bet a hand like 10s or queens. Um, I think he would play fast with the ace-jack or, or if he had a jack. I think he could play a flush draw like this, although he might just open shove the river with a flush. Hmm. I'm very close to shoving this for value. Given that he called so quickly... Um, oh, I'm just going to check it. Yeah, two queens. Okay, so that was sort of what I was worried about. See, I thought he would play that a little bit faster pre-flop. Um, but obviously I was just wrong, because <laughs> he didn't. Um, I do stand by my, my flop and turn bets, though, because players like that will often um, try to draw with ace-king on a flop like that, but once you bet the turn, they'll give up. And I was only betting half pot once again, so when you bet half pot, your bluff only needs to work a third of the time. And even though it didn't happen to work in that circumstance, obviously two queens is the absolute pinnacle of his range, because I don't think that there's any doubt, really, that he would have played two kings or two aces faster. Um, given that we've seen him fast play things in the past, I think he would have raised a jack right away on the flop. And so, given all those ideas, I think that uh, that our play looks pretty good. Ace-8 suited, I'm definitely going to play. The question is for a re-raise or a call. I think I'm just going to call, though. And... Uh, reevaluate as things go along. And now I'm just basically hoping I'm ahead. And when he pots the turn, I'm done with it. I've got to slow down a little bit now that I've been caught with my pants down. I'm not going to three about more rooms with the Jack 9 offsuit on the right hand table. And obviously, you know, this isn't this isn't a lesson in. You know, well, I should say this, is that a lot of my plays haven't worked, but I still stand by them. I think a lot of them uh, were sharp, and hopefully you guys are are able to happily comprehend the reasoning behind the plays and not just 
um, you know, if they happen to work out the way we want them to or not. Flower power, power is attacking out of small blind um, versus an under the gun raiser. Um, I'm going to tend to give him a bit of credit here. I wonder if Morims will do the same. Like this is not a flop I ever expect Morims with his tendencies to fold. So if Flower Powers is betting this flop, although you know he does he does see bet a lot of flops, so it's possible that he could just be on air here. But I, I tend to think he has something, or I tend to think. <laughs> rather that I would have something if I were him and I was betting two streets here. Although, you know, on the flip side, since Morims does flow a lot of flops, this might not be a bad spot to fire again and put him in a tough decision. This is actually a pretty interesting hand. Uh, tank and call. I'm not, not sure what, what how I would read that if I were if I were Flower Power. I sort of expect more rooms to call here. And he's good. So interesting. Um, definitely worth noting, and I'm going to make a note of this, uh, that he re-raised an under-the-gun razor and fired three streets and instantly on the river. Ace-king on... Three five, six five or two five, six five eight. A very interesting pot there. I I think I like Moirum's Moirum's play for sure. Flower powers. It's interesting. It's definitely a play that you just see from time to time. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable. Truth be told. I mean, you you really need to know your opponent. I personally wouldn't expect Moirum's to fold a pair there, especially after tanking, because when guys tank on the term, they tend to understand that that means that they had a decision, and they don't typically fold the river after tanking for that long, so I'm not sure if I would have fired the third barrel, but of course hindsight's 2020. Once the money was in there, I wasn't sure Morims was going to call him. Once again, Morims had the top of his range with the two jacks, although probably two jacks is the same as two nines or, or two sevens there, because Flower Powers isn't always going to three bet and just go with it um, with those smaller hands on on boards like that. I mean, given the fact that a lot of smaller pairs have just made sets, you know, like if he had pocket tens, he's what, hoping that his opponent had exactly pocket nines or pocket sevens, uh, or a hero call with like threes or fours. That's a little bit of wish casting, so. We're going to wrap it up probably in one more spin, so hopefully we'll get in some, some decent spots between now and then. Um... Given the fact that these two guys don't really raise a lot of flops, I'm just going to bet this. I had checked J.K. Hossie's and well, I had checked Nambla's stats earlier. Sorry, and he hadn't been too aggressive in the past. But um, when the five comes off on the term, terrible card for me to represent anything. You know, even if I had a big hand, I might be scared by that card. So now I'm just going to give up. But I like a C bet on the flop um, with the idea that you know Nambla can certainly have. Something like ace x suited or um, ten nine suited, jack ten suited, stuff like that, that I can get him to fold with a bet. But I don't want to check to him because that gives him great incentive to bluff. Moyram's 4-betting PA Dirk, I would be checking in on his 4-bet stats, which are pretty light. So when Moyram's 4-bets, if it's my money in PA Dirk's spot, I'm giving him pretty much, give, just pretty much giving him credit there. Not that I do a ton of 5-bet shove bluffing anyway. I expect Moyram's to just snap call. It, you know, two queens, two aces. A standard spot, but it looks like PA Dirk might get punished for his slow rolling and Hollywooding technique. Nice to see the karma gods 
throwing their hats into the ring there. Like in a situation like that, do we really need to just wait and posture? Like if the guy is calling, he's calling. You don't need to ask for time. Uh, any of that BS. It, it typically bothers me when people do stuff like that. And I know he just got his aces cracked, but I'm hoping that he knows that that looks tilty. And I don't think he's going to let it... Yeah, I, I think he might put the first raise in um, <coughs> with a little tilt, but I didn't think he would come after me again after just getting stacked in that previous pot. So I'm excited to leave this right-hand table when the video's over. Because <laughs> it's just not... It's just not a good one. Not really much else I can say about that. I'm desperately hoping against hope that I can make a hand against J.K. Hossie on the left-hand table. 7-5 offsuit is not going to be the one. But uh, that seems like a good as time as any to wrap it up. So I hope you guys had a great time. A great time. An absolutely marvelous time watching the video today. And that you'll be enthusiastic about giving feedback in the forums. I look forward to answering any questions you might have and to catching up there. So until next time, folks, having a good day. Bye-bye.